So we're done with the technical classes. We've covered the basic skills. From here on out, the focus is on the final projects. And the remaining classes, the lectures, are going to be context around what we've covered. This week, I'm going to step back to look at what you can do with all the skills. Week after that, I'm going to talk about managing uh, invention, intellectual property, income, life cycle of uh, projects in the lab. The week after that, I'm going to tour final projects, and then we're up to the presentations already. So no new technical content. Uh, main focus is the final projects, and the classes are going to be context. So this week is now when we really pivot to focus on the final project. You've survived the weekly pace of skills. This first link is to, in two weeks, I'm going to give you a tour of final projects. So th these are greatest hits from history of final projects. I'm going to walk through a bunch of them to show you <clears throat> lots of different examples of what a final project looks like. And in particular, if you look at them, you'll see almost all of you are well behind just on documenting your work of what goes into it. And the final project is a masterpiece. Let's see. Uh, Hafey is asking about uh, signing up. Uh, we don't want to do sign ups until um, here. I'm getting in to check that. Uh, we don't want to do sign ups until students are far enough along to be ready to sign up. And um, I'll, I'll have that for you in a second. Uh, May 24, yeah, so after the next class is then, then we'll be ready to start with the signups for the final projects. So let, let me explain masterpiece. In, in, in English, masterpiece has come to refer to a a great work of art, you know, the, you, you say that's a masterpiece, but that's not the, the original meaning of the word. The, the meaning of masterpiece is <clears throat> in a guild to graduate, <clears throat> excuse me, and become a member of the guild, you had to make a masterpiece. It's a piece that shows mastery. And so it's not specifically a great work of art. It's something that demonstrates the skills for the guild to become a master. And so your final project, it could be a great work of art. It could be a thesis. It could be a startup. It could be your life's work. That's really up to you. On our side, we just want to see mastery. The, the project is to show that you've mastered the individual skills. And the real point is the integration. So throughout the Fab Academy cycle, we've covered all of these skills separately. The final project is where you integrate them. So the homework for this week is Settle, finally, what's your final project? So uh, make a detailed proposal. And the questions I want to know are, what's your project going to do? 
So we had the uh, thing to count and share recycling. Uh, who's done what beforehand? So there's a notion of standing on the shoulders of giants of, of your predecessors at, versus standing on their toes. Uh, um, I, you can absolutely do something somebody's done before, but the goal is not simply to replicate it or do a worse version. The goal is to build on what came before you and do a better version. So I want you to explore who's done what before. And a good starting point is just the search engine we have built into the page. So who's done what? And so then how, how does your work relate to that? At this stage, I want to know what you're going to design. You should have a complete system diagram. You should have the inventory of the materials and components. For the weekly assignments, your labs provided everything. For the final project, looking ahead to life beyond the class, I want you to know where the things you're using come from and how much they'll cost. And the guidance for that is the labs expect to spend tens of dollars a person on uh, materials, components, supplies from the inventory. Uh, you can go beyond that if you want to invest, for example, in higher quality wood, th things beyond what the class supplies. But there's a basic amount of resources the lab can supply. Um, anything beyond that doesn't change the evaluation. It's just if, if you, you want them for um, how you're going to use the project. I, I want to know at this stage what you need to make, how you're going to make them. And then an important thing at this stage is uh, the questions you need to answer. So um, let me make a note on that. So we had the phone projector. A key question there is what sort of lenses they'll be and what kind of optics. And then one more thing I want you to, at this stage, look at is how should we about how should you and how should we evaluate your project so we want to know more than what i did we want to know did it work how, how how do you decide if it's successful what's the criterion for evaluating it um and i i don't have a note here um but one more thing you should do this week for this week's assignment is make a detailed schedule between now and finishing so we're going to have four sessions for the final presentations. And you really need a day-by-day -day schedule to be able to finish on time. So uh, make a detailed planning schedule. Now, in the project, I want to see that you can design in 2D and 3D. I want to see you can use processes that are both additive and subtractive. You can design and produce electronics you can embed microcontrollers, which means the microcontroller goes into your project, not you into it. Um, you can interface it, you can program it. And I'd say this is the most important one and often the worst one. You don't just design the parts, you need to design the system. You need to make a design of how all the parts come together and then how you package it to present it. So it's not just a, a, a tangle of wires on a breadboard, but it's an integrated system where you design the packaging. And the, this last part may seem like the smallest part, but in some ways it's the hardest part and can take the most time. Then where possible, I want you to make rather than buy things to learn how to do it. And then you can work together, but in a specific way. We don't want it to separate to one person does hardware and one does software. You need to make a complete separable system so that your project can be demonstrated in isolation, but then you can make the systems that come together in a, in a larger system. So like if it's a drone project, there's one whole system on propulsion, one on navigation, uh, one can be on mission payloads. You can demonstrate and develop each of them separately 
but then integrate them in a more powerful drone. Now, this requirement to integrate all of these skills that we've covered is uh, for the masterpiece. Most projects you'll do in life don't need to check off all of these different skills in one project. Here, what we're looking for is a somewhat artificial extra requirement that you take all these different skills and integrate them to drive system integration. But it doesn't need to be heroic. So you need a microcontroller to show that you know how to use them, but it doesn't have to be a autonomous AI system in the microcontroller. It's fine if it reads a button and controls the light. We need to show that you can do each skill. Each skill doesn't need to be heroic. Again, the real focus is integrating the skills. So this week's assignment is you're going to finally drill in and make the detailed proposal and plan for your final project. Uh, then looking ahead in the next week class where I talk about things like intellectual property, uh, you're going to start the work of the final presentation. You're going to be making a video and a slide. And this won't be done until you present, but uh, you should already have much of the work for the final project by this stage. And so next week's assignment is you'll make draft of the summary slide and video. Then the week after that, where I do the tour of final projects, uh, you finish working on it. And I'll talk about uh, project management in that class, what you need to do in the, in the final push. And then we'll be up to the presentation. And in the presentation, that's where you uh, fill in the answers to the questions uh, and you present the work. Okay, so that's where we are. And now what I wanna do for the rest of today's class is take you on a tour of what you can do with the skills we've covered. Uh, some of these links are very recent, some are historical, but they, they give you a tour of now that we've covered all the things we've covered, what you can do for each one. Oh, the, um, the presentations Andre is asking, they're uh, extremely short. So the video is, um, let's see here. Um, the video is about a minute long. Um, at the pace we go to get through everybody, it's just a few minutes a person. And to understand th this few minute pace, uh, a few minutes a person is just enough time to do the demonstration clip and um, if possible, show it live. And then uh, in the review process, much more slowly, we'll go through your website to see everything that you did. But the live presentations you'll do, it's just a few minutes a person. Um, yeah, and Ricardo was noting, people tend to go towards the end. Uh, um, if you go to a session that's less crowded, we can spend a little more. Um, and then let's see, uh, Jason is asking about the LED example. Um, yeah, Jason, so it, something as simple as designing a circuit board uh, where you design the circuit board and put a processor in it, um, and it reads a button as an input and controls an LED as the output, that shows the skills. That's a pretty low bar. I hope, I hope you'll do a little more than that. But uh, that embeds a microcontroller, interfaces it, and writes a program. So it, it satisfies the letter but you should go a little bit further than just blinking an LED at, at this stage. But, but that does illustrate all the things I'm describing. But yeah, the presentations are very short. It's just a few minutes a person. We'll have a detailed minute by minute schedule. And the video clip is about a minute long. Okay, so Let's take a tour now. So one of the things you can do is uh, 
medical intervention. And this slide links to when the pandemic hit, uh, this is a repository of meetings of what grew to hundreds of people working on the response to the pandemic. That was a good illustration. So um, one of the projects uh, did um, uh, electron microscopy and airflow measurements to test uh, and um, fluid simulation to test uh, exposure to viruses. Um, one developed and tested swabs for um, making samples. And there was a lot of work on uh, protective equipment, both for individuals, but for frontline healthcare workers that included uh, shields, um, uh, stations for intubation. Um, one of the things that came out from it is for the frontline healthcare workers, the simple shields people were making uh, could be borderline uh, useless or dangerous in that air could get in around them and they could trap um, particles in the way they were constructed. And so in this project, there was a lot of laboratory research on how to do these things effectively and safely. But once that's done, they turn into open designs. And so, for example, the Mumbai Fab Lab coordinated uh, PPE production across India in the scale of uh, millions of units um, based on first doing this kind of curation. And so the rapid prototyping response to the pandemic ended up filling a gap between do it yourself on small scales that does that responds quickly but doesn't scale and industrial production that's scalable but can't respond quickly and so the fab network uh stepped in and in this coordinated way helped with the uh pandemic response and there's links here to some uh, videos that tell tell the story through that So electronics, uh, you've learned to make electronics. Uh, Sean was one of the early Fab Academy instructors who really bonded with making electronics. And so he started a company, Modern Device, uh, where he sells the sort of things you've been making. So you've been making you know, electronics of the week, uh, just that uh, there's uh, lots of different kinds of demand for it. And so he started a company that sells uh, the kind of electronics he was doing in the class. Then um, I've mentioned this, but just to recap it, uh, this was a student in the input device week um, who did a nice project making a simple oscilloscope. And so uh, here he's digitizing a signal. Um, so you, you can think about this as uh, how to measure almost anything. And uh, Yanni has been um, uh, keeping an index of these. Uh, in your lab is test equipment. Uh, with the tools we've uh, been using, you can make test equipment. So you can, you can make a, a voltmeter, you can make an oscilloscope. Um, I'll link. Um, uh, there was a nice project, uh, uh, somebody in a fab lab made a soldering iron. Uh, I, I have one of them in my office. I don't recall who did that, if anybody can remember that link. But there was a nice fab lab project to make your own soldering iron. Um, these things are increasingly um, uh, commoditized. Uh, but making them is interesting because the skills are local, the jobs are local, you can customize them. So you can make test equipment. Uh, from there, you can make, um, let's see, uh, Yanni, where's the page you've been keeping on um, uh, how to measure almost anything? I'll look for the link. I'll, I'll put it in the chat in a minute. Yeah, I don't recall where that link was. Um, so. From electronics comes consumer electronics. This was a nice project from a student. Uh, his final project was a boombox. And so this is all the parts of it. So 
uh, he has a processor reading an SD card, um, decoding MP3, going to an audio chain um, with speakers, with the controls, um, uh, and um, you know, making complete uh, consumer electronics as, as a project. So uh, this was a nice example of a um, nicely finished uh, boombox. And it's a simple but complete example of what I was describing of um, system integration of how all the parts fit together. So this was a, a, a surprising early version of making a phone. This was one of the first uh, DIY phones. Uh, this was David, um, uh, MIT student who took how to make, who um, for many years led software for the Arduino project. And he got interested in um, uh, making a cell phone. And so this wasn't a high-end smartphone. It was just a basic minimal communication phone. But using a basic um, uh, chipset, uh, he was able to go all the way through and make a basic audio phone from scratch. And um, more modern descendants from that are projects like um, uh, Fairphone uh, is an o a much more advanced uh, open phone project. Um, but this was a hello world of actually making a, a phone from scratch. Um, and let's see, Yanni put in the chat, um, uh, Fab Measure is a page um, uh, looking at uh, some of these open measurement projects. Um, and then, yeah, again, if somebody can recall the soldering iron, if not, I'll, I'll hunt back to find that. So a basic phone. Then this was a few years back. Uh, this was... Um, Max and David, who went on to co-found uh, Formlabs, and for remote communication, uh, they did a project to make a um, computer terminal. So I, I've mentioned how much I like uh, uh, curses, just uh, moving characters on a text terminal. Uh, um, there are web browsers that are simply reduced down to text-based. It's a very bandwidth efficient. It needs simple displays. And so uh, with a more powerful processor and dev board, you can generate HDMI. Um, what they did was um, with just a simple processor, and I think this was a, uh, okay, this was SDM32. It's fast enough to synthesize basic video signals. And so for just a couple dollars in parts, they implemented a terminal aimed at low that produces video output aimed at low cost uh, communication. Um, and at this point, you can buy uh, relatively few dollar dev boards that in hardware do HDMI. And it's just reaching the point now where you can do um, digital. Vi this is analog video, but you can do digital video and software on the fastest processors we're using. Uh, so that's making a computer terminal. Then from a terminal, um, this was a nice project from uh, Bunny, a legendary um, uh, student from MIT who's done all sorts of open projects and reverse engineering. And he wanted to make a complete open source laptop. And so uh, this was a, a um, complete design of an open laptop. And the, uh, one part of it over here is named for one of my students he worked with, Nadia, as the um, extension breadboarding part of it. And he went all the way through um, producing, yeah, here's Bunny, uh, this open laptop. It doesn't compete on price or performance on what you can buy, but it's a completely open design you can reproduce and extend. Then once you have a laptop, you need something to connect it to. Um, see this, uh, 
yeah, um, Jason is linking to Cyberdex. Uh, this was a project that started in a lab in Afghanistan, um, went on to Kenya, and it was there was no telecom infrastructure. And in the project, we looked at a lot of different ways to make regional networks. And after testing many different types of radios and antennas, what came out was something surprisingly simple, which is in the background, you see a segment of a parabola. Uh, in uh, the way the geometry works is um, if you have a parabola and at the focus, all the lines that come in straight uh, reflect into the parabola, uh, into the focus. And so rather than developing a special radio and antenna, this is just a commodity Wi Fi access point, but it's put at the focus of the parabola. And then you need to tweak the software a little bit for the delays for back up, backing off. Um, uh, but what it then lets you do is make a link on the order of 10 kilometers. And then once you have links on the order of many kilometers, you can then set up a citywide network. And in turn, you can use that to do uh, messaging uh, without a, um, a telecom provider, and uh, you can uh, cache local sources of information uh, like Wikipedia, the Fab Archives, all of that were supplied through it. And so it was using the tools in the lab to now make a regional area networks. And I see uh, Stephen is linking um, Bunny's guide. Um, so yeah, this, Bunny is a great resource for Shenzhen. Um, uh, and also uh, Eric Pan who runs Seed is another really good friend of the network and a great guide to Shenzhen. And so uh, you can really think about making regional networks out of your lab where, where you actually manage and run uh, the network, not uh, paying a, a provider. Then, uh, this is a link to a CubeSat. Uh, launch vehicles often have both space um, uh, in their fairings and some room in their weight budget. And so there's a number of open projects to launch CubeSats. And if you look at a CubeSat, what's in here are just the sort of things we covered. You need to make the frame you know, you uh, make the electronics, you need to mount it a bit better so it doesn't vibrate. But the kind of electronics in a CubeSat is really no different than what we've been making. And so there are a number of projects uh, creating local space programs. Uh, and so it, it's not crazy <clears throat> to link up to one of these uh, CubeSat launch programs. And there's a standard form factor for that uh, shown in that image. Uh, and you could have a space program in your fab lab. And it really is realistic. You really could do that. Uh, this summer will be in Bhutan. And uh, uh, Bhutan has launched its own um, space agency working on small uh, CubeSats, ju just like uh, we've been talking about. Then. This we've already talked a lot about. Um, we're at the Fab 2.0 stage where you can make, at this point, all of the machines in your lab have open designs with good performance. And so we're just at the edge of transitioning from buying Fab Labs to making Fab Labs. And that's one of the most important transitions. And it's not simply to reproduce the machines in your lab. It's uh, the skills and jobs can be local, but then the machines can be adapted to the local needs of the community in your lab. Uh, Materium already came up today. 
and I want to stress that uh, bit by bit, we want to reduce the global supply chains going into fab labs and make them more sustainably locally. You know, ultimately, that means things like making uh, integrated circuits in the lab a little bit further out. But a big one is just the materials. So the materials for your laser cutter or the feedstock for your printer or the stock for large machining, uh, there are a range of ways to source them from forest products, from uh, waste plastic, from all sorts of food waste, let you make a range of high performance materials. So Alicia has been devoted to it. Um, you know, this, this is a biocomposite made from uh, eggshells. Uh, just to take that as an example, when you cook with eggs, the, the shells go in the trash, but the eggshells are actually a really interesting uh, uh, material. And there's a, you know, coffee grounds are another interesting waste material uh, that you can make high performance materials out of. Uh, so I really encourage thinking about uh, how much of the material use in your lab can be sourced locally from your lab. And a Materium is a great platform to coordinate that. Um, and let's see, uh, if we go back to um, uh, one of the projects we did at Haystack Labs was a uh, super wood. And I think, so um, uh, super wood, um, is a process um, where you take wood and you densify it and you make something stronger than steel um, out of just starting with uh, wood. Um, so those are materials. Uh, robots. Uh, I, I, I picked this as just an example. Um, this is, was done by uh, two of my students. Um, this is, and I don't recall if there's a video. Oh, good. Yeah. So um, Okay, so th this is a bounding robot that was used for studying gates. And um, the whole thing was made um, on a shop bot. Um, th this was a good example of just um, uh, uh, every part here was machined on a shop bot uh, to make this beautiful uh, bounding robot. Uh, other labs started by former student Saul uh, uh, has been a pioneer in uh, building uh, inflatables. And so by cutting and sewing, you can make, uh, th this is a robot that walks, uh, this is a car that you um, steer by leaning. Um, they've made dexterous arms. Um, uh, all by uh, cutting, sewing, and inflating um, to make inflatable structures. Uh, there have been a number of boats in Fab Labs. This, this, this one was uh, Sam, who I showed you before. This was a combination of two weeks. Uh, in one week, make something big. He cut out the frame for the kayak. And then in composite, in wildcard week, uh, he did the skin. And so he laid up a skin and then um, uh, made a composite skin to seal it. And he made this gorgeous uh, kayak as a boat project in the lab. Then I had mentioned to uh, for the nice uh, cardboard projects in Singapore, uh, this bicycle project. Uh, so this was Kenny, a former student now at NASA. Uh, he didn't uh, 
at this stage makes the other parts of the bicycle is just the bike frame. But to make the custom bike frame, uh, it was just cut from cardboard. And I mentioned this in Wildcard Week. And then he laid up the composite around it and the cardboard stayed within the composite um, um, as the core of the composite. And so that was an example of a custom bike frame uh, made as a composite layup project. Uh, fun project, uh, uh, John, um, in 2022, uh, made skis. So he wanted to make electric ski skis. And so he went through all the steps of, uh, it makes something uh, big, he made the tooling. And then uh, he did the composite layup of all of the steps to um, laminate and lay up the composite ski. And Jean-Michel, who works with the Fab Academy, has also experimented with uh, making custom skis this way. Uh, there have been many. Um, yeah, let's see, Jason is asking about Boston Dynamics. So Boston Dynamics uh, started from a colleague at MIT, Mark Raber. He, he's uh, a colleague and um, another colleague who's now the CTO of um, Chief Scientist at Toyota, Gil Pratt, was also involved in the early leg work. But that was led by Mark Raber, who studied legs at MIT and then started Boston Dynamics. Uh, there have been many drones and um, uh, Danielle and Gracia, who's now in Germany, uh, 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 did a beautiful job making complete drones in the lab where he did the whole stack, where he made the drone and the control system um, uh, as, as uh, complete fab lab projects. And then from there, he went on to machine building. This is an interesting emerging one. Uh, this picture is the Barcelona Fab Lab. And uh, they did a fab car project. Uh, let's see, this is a link to, okay, so their site is still up. Um, and so this was a uh, wood frame car for an electric vehicle um, done as a project out of the Barcelona Fab Lab. And with electric vehicles, it's increasingly feasible to make a car. The regulatory status of these is very much a work in progress. Um, but EVs make, um, I've shown smaller versions of um, uh, vehicles uh, in the last years, how to make at MIT. Um, there was a nice um, smaller vehicle project, uh, this one. Uh, they, they made an electric ATV um, as the class project. Let's see. I, um, and it was, um, oh, let's see. Um, yeah, so uh, that, that they made an all-terrain vehicle, and this was a fab car project. So it's increasingly feasible to actually make real transportation. Uh, for the environment, a nice example is Tomas, who runs Fab City, took his Fab Academy project and developed a sensor kit. And then the sensor kit became the basis of Smart Citizen. And Smart Citizen takes these sensors and then he aggregates them to do regional environmental monitoring. And there are a number of examples where they've used this to have impacts on things like uh, regional policy and planning by doing distributed environmental data collection. This is an interesting opportunity. There hasn't been enough of this yet. Uh, this is a project from uh, uh, Tom Odoyo, colloquially called Shopbot Tom. 
and I believe he was in Kenya, uh, and he fell in love with the shop bot. Um, and so he did, this is a project where he's making uh, composite blades to make a, a wind power generator. And so we've covered the power electronics, covered power electronics. We've seen some heliostat projects for PV and with the tools in the lab, you can make uh, turbines for, you know, you've learned how to spin motors to make energy out, running the same thing in the opposite direction is energy in to make turbines for energy conversion. Uh, food, uh, Guillaume did a final project where he made an aquaponic system. Uh, this is a, a page that's tracking a number of different uh, food related projects. And then uh, AgriLab, uh, Luke and AgriLab is looking ahead to um, how to grow almost anything or uh, AgriCademy. And so these are all, uh, oh, good. This has been updated since I saw this last. Um, these are all projects using the tools we've covered to make food. It's not uh, molecular nanotechnology. It's just taking uh, traditional uh, farming. And you can do it in a number of different ways, much more resource efficiently. Um, by controlling the inputs and outputs this way, and you can do it vertically, and you can do it in things like urban environments. And so I, I think food is going to be a, I was going to say killer application, it's sort of an anti-killer application. It's, it's, it's a health, not a killer application of using your lab to make infrastructure to grow food. Uh, this is a link to uh, tools in a bio lab uh, made in a fab lab. So one of the sister classes is uh, Bio Academy. And you can essentially make all the tools now in a bio lab in a fab lab. So you can use your fab lab to start a bio lab. You still need reagents uh, for it, but all of the bio lab tools can be made in, in the fab lab. Uh, this is one of my uh, students, Manu, did a really interesting talk on making a uh, $1 microscope. And it's done by folding it and making a single precision le lens. And this is good enough to see at the limit of what an optical microscope can resolve, mi micron scale, to see micro uh, microbial worlds, micro worlds. And um, this has been very successful, uh, millions of these folded microscopes. And then I had mentioned uh, for ULU, uh, in this project, working with the National Institute of Standards in the US, we looked at making not simple citizen science of something like measuring temperature or light, but advanced citizen science of making scientific instruments. And so um, there are videos here of the talks. Uh, Richard makes, uses flexures, which we talked about, um, to make precision um, motion systems for high resolution microscopes. Um, he makes Raman spectrometers and a Raman spectrometer is one of the main tools for chemical information. So you can use it to do uh, chemical characterization of uh, materials. Um, uh, these are talks on making instruments that do open materials measurement to characterize material properties. Um, uh, he does wild stuff. He takes uh, elements of consumer electronics, like a CD player, and then turns them into biosensors and turns them into atomic force microscopes to do atomic scale resolution. And so you, you really could in your lab make an AFM, an atomic force microscope to, to do, um, to see atoms. Um, uh, Gideon's asking about uh, the, the um, uh, use in fiber optics. Uh, Raman transitions, um, 
are uh, energy inelastic. And so it, it, in one case, you're using the um, uh, transition to add energy to a system for gain. Um, in uh, spectroscopy, you're using these Raman transitions to learn about chemical information. Um, so all of these are a surprising range of scientific instruments you can make in your lab. Um, this is a link to a project that's um, uh, developed uh, prosthetics. And um, there's now a lively collaboration. Um, Adriana, are you on? Um, there's a lively collaboration on FabCare. And I don't recall the site for that. Um, but there's a lively group of fab labs working on a range of uh, assistive technology, and in particular, a range of prosthetics you can use for all sorts of disabilities you can make in the lab. Um, uh, so, a link from Adrian on this. And okay, good. Yeah, this is the Fab Care link I was looking at. This is a collaboration across Fab Labs developing um, uh, a range of assistive technologies. Uh, shoes. This was a nice project. Um, uh, uh, from a student who um, wanted to make sneakers. And so uh, um, what he's doing here is it's molding and casting. Um, he makes a mold and then um, the mold then has this um, inset structure. And the logic of this is um, the first casting is with a fairly flexible material, and that's the deformation of the sole. And then the, the, the posts then get filled with a second material um, that's uh, stiffer, and then that's what gives you the support. So the, it's a very anisotropic material. It, it supports you well vertically, but then it flexes uh, horizontally. And you use that to make uh, custom sneakers. Uh, so once you can make uh, sneakers, then uh, there have been all sorts of clothes related projects. So uh, Niterate overlaps with a few fab labs and has slowly come to life um, making an open knitting machine. And uh, the software development developer for that worked, uh, spent a while in my lab, and now he has uh, a, a startup doing stuff like this as a cloud service. But this is uh, computerized knitting machines are about a hundred thousand dollar investment. This is bringing it down to ten thousand dollar scale um, to do programmable knitting, and this is likely to be an important part of. If you think about fab cities producing what they consume, um, an important part of local clothing production. Um, this started in part as an open project, became a business. Uh, it's still percolating. There's a few versions of open projects uh, to pick up this lineage of open knitting. Um, that, that's very much in transition right now. Uh, uh, to, men, to explain art, uh, um, I've mentioned a few times Haystack. This is, in the US, the premier retreat for craft. And so at Haystack, they have studios for making ceramics, doing glass blowing, woodworking, um, blacksmithing, fine jewelry. Uh, working with fibers, um, printing. 
And in the middle of that, we set up a fab lab. And initially, it was very controversial there. There was a real kind of battle between how craft related to the fab lab. But very quickly, it got adopted because in, in this setting, nobody designs there on the computer. They design in traditional media, but they use the Fab Lab as a transformation device. So there was an artist struck by the light on the ocean in Maine, how it, it sparkled. And so we worked with her to take images of that, um, turned it into topography, and then use that to slump glass so that the glass sparkled like the ocean. Or another example is this is intaglio printing, where you print into plates that deform so that the printing is raised. And it was uh, previously very tedious to make the intaglio print plates, but we found the PCB milling process makes perfect uh, intaglio print plates. And so artists would draw by hand um, the, the printing they wanted to do and then make these print plates. Or another example was uh, using the ShopBot, they could make small sketches and then we could turn them into huge blocks for woodblock printing to do giant prints. And so these are all examples of using the lab, not as a design tool, but as a transformation tool to make things bigger, smaller, stronger um, for art. Uh, Michelle's noting laser engraving for linoleum stamps, uh, again, for printing, uh, printmaking. Um, there are also a lot of problems there that one of the reasons why I like this lab so much is it challenges everything that we do. So, for example, the, the mods project started because originally we used just commercial CAM software but kept tripping over artists wanting to make something on a machine that wasn't designed for it. And then there are all sorts of experiments with materials there, um, many of which fail. Like we discovered uh, some, an artist wanted to laser cut hair and it turns out it's a really bad idea. Um, it smells terrible and it ignites and just don't laser cut hair. Uh, but there's a lot of really interesting experimenting like that there. Uh, Alex, alum from the Vogue Fab Lab, um, made beautiful musical instruments. So um, he got obsessed with making a bass guitar. And he spent quite a while um, doing this gorgeous, let's see, I don't know, if, I don't see more pictures, um, but uh, made this beautiful bass guitar. Um, just combining uh, the machining uh, we do uh, with the electronics, so making the whole thing. Um, and then um, he got interested in these um, uh, tongue drums. And uh, again, this gorgeous drum was just made with the tools we've covered, um, but as a Fab Lab project, so making uh, custom musical instruments. Uh, furniture. Ohad, are you on today? Uh, no, he's, uh, so he's not here today. Um, this is a wonderful story out of uh, Ohad's lab in Holon. Um, the, so uh, this is, was a mixed community, a low-income community. Uh, in it, um, the, uh, there was what was supposed to be a um, community space uh, that was uh, sad and completely neglected. And so this tells the story of Ohad did a workshop with kids from the community where he asked them to design what they wanted in their space, um, to design the furniture in the space. Then he worked with them in the fab lab. Okay, good. Yeah, there are these images. So they did design studies to design the furniture. Um, then he worked with them to make the furniture in the lab. And then it became their lab. And it had this huge impact. It transformed 
the space because it was now a space that um, they designed, that they inspired. Uh, and many of them were inspi so inspired from this, they wanted to study digital fabrication and become designers and it opened their eyes to uh, new opportunities in life. And so I, I really like the model of when you create a fab lab, you don't buy the furniture, you get the lab working and then you make the furniture in the lab. Um, uh, Vanessa, remind me, Vanessa, what's your platform link? For uh, uh, yes, I will. If you can put that in the chat. We've seen yes, it before yes. and yeah. The, um, the website. Yeah. Um, uh, I won't spend uh, more time on it now because uh, she's going to join the recitation on startups we're going to do, not in the coming Monday, but after that on uh, the startup she has around this uh, furniture creation program. And you can press a test, test a prototype. Okay. Um, okay, well, here, let's see. The, um, we'll, we'll see this uh, in the startup recitation, but just quickly, uh, yeah. she has this nice platform that lets you uh, customize the furniture and then make the custom furniture. Yep. Um, so so you can really think about making the furniture in your lab, in your community. So then from furniture, I'd say the biggest fab lab project ever was the this, where um, it, it almost killed the Barcelona lab, but they made a solar house. Um, they did contract out some of the cutting just for capacity, um, but the whole thing was done out of the lab. The only thing they didn't do in the lab was the control system for the smart house for the solar decathlon. And that was the one thing that didn't work well, the commercial solution. And in retrospect, they wish they had done that internally. Um, but they made this solar house with all the furniture in it as a large scale rapid prototyping project. Um, so that was a really impressive one. And then th there are a number of other related ones like uh, WikiHouse, which is just doing exactly the sort of large format machining we've been doing. But um, you, you saw the giant uh, bear from Singapore in cardboard. If you make it in um, more permanent structural materials, you can then make shelter. And so these are all projects making uh, housing. Um, then, um, Dan, actually, yeah, rather than here, let me move this to, um, is Danielle connected? Um, so in machines came out of Danielle's machine building. And from there, they've developed an open lab starter kit. And you saw this in the machine recitation. And so now this is not just a machine, but they have put together <laughs> all of the machines um, uh, to make uh, a, a complete lab from scratch. Um, And let's see, the um, mobile labs in Ukraine, Danielle has been outfitting to help with the reconstruction in Ukraine. Um, and oh, this is a VOG project, uh, Casting with Mud. Explain this, Hank. It was already a long time ago. It was at the picnic festival. Ah, okay. It uh, uh, used uh, ancient building techniques uh, together with uh, computer generated uh, designs. Interesting. And I see, yeah, Jason is suggesting Debart in Bhutan doing composite. And when I say composite, um, the composite can be friendly. It can be natural fibers and uh, bio resins, but to lay up on cardboard to make um, shelter would be a, a great uh, Bhutan project. Um, Blair, are you on today? Um, so Blair, who led the Fab Lab in Detroit and is now working 
in a really interesting um, community in northern uh, Michigan. Um, uh, let me see if I can find a, a link for that. Um, uh, um, uh, he's, yeah. Um, Blair, after leading the lab in Detroit, is now um, doing this in Idlewild, which was a historic um, vacation spot for Black people that fell into disrepair. And now he's leading a, a, a renaissance, a renewal of this community. And what, let's see, yeah, there's a, um, a few good links on that. I'll, I'll, I'll move this link to there. Uh, what he's doing now is designing communities. He's actually really designing how a whole community functions. And so it's not, not just a machine or a project, but um, building a community. So uh, I'll come back to this link. Uh, this is the Fab City project. And so let me go back and explain that in a little more detail. Uh, Vicente Gayart uh, helped start the Fab Lab in Barcelona. And to understand the history of that, if you look at um, the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia is this impressive space with these impressive programs. And the way it started originally was uh, this group of founders wanted to Let's see, let's, if we go back to IAC Fab Lab. Um, the, uh, if you look at just the range of programs run out of the Fab Lab, they originally just needed a place to get a large format machine to make things. And so they wanted to get a warehouse. And so to get the warehouse, they needed to invent an organization and so they made up the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia, but it then became real. So that became the Fab Lab. And then over a period of years, it grew into the city planning because Barcelona has a fabulous design sense, but historically it's had a huge youth unemployment, roughly 50% youth unemployment. So limiting the ability of a generation to work. And so Vicente became the city planner of Barcelona, Gaudi's descendant in, in charge of city planning. And what he led was creating uh, a, a network of ateliers, they called them, of fab labs in Barcelona, in communities, with the notion that instead of products going in one side and trash going out the other side, that the atoms would stay, but the bits would come and go. And so that idea led to the Fab City Initiative, which is a 40-year countdown to urban self-sufficiency. And it's not a step at the end, it's a few percent a year. And it led to dramatic things. I was uh, on one trip where at the very edge of Barcelona, pushed up against the hills, was, was a uh, poor immigrant community. And um, one of these labs was gonna come in and they had a protest saying, we don't want a lab, we just need food, give us a food bank. And I was at a dramatic session with, the, session with them where the city explained, you can have a food bank, but you're gonna depend on us to supply it. And at some point it'll stop. Or with the lab, you can make all the things I've just described. You can make furniture and you can make systems to grow food. Um, uh, and there was this really dramatic pivot where the community then embraced this notion of having those skills. Uh, this was a planning project to look at taking Pobla now, the district around the Barcelona lab and building a complete economy around it. And so if you take everything I've spent the last hour walking through, these are all the ingredients you need for a city to produce what it consumes. Uh, and so there's a small set of high-tech global consumables 
like say precision end mills or microcontrollers, but much of the rest of the supply chain can be made locally. And so the Fab City program has grown into um, this complete autonomous sister program with about 50 cities around the world with a series of programs um, with overlapping events. So in Bhutan, there'll be an overlapping gathering of these uh, Fab Cities. And one of the newest things happening is what's starting to emerge are uh, Fab City Labs. And so the idea of the Fab City Labs are um, uh, labs to <coughs> develop and propagate best practices in all of these other things I've been talking about. <clears throat> so best practices in, for example, aquaponics and hydroponics of you know, what are the resources in, what is the productivity out, how much food can you grow in a certain time in a certain volume, um, designs for micro turbines, things like that, building up the, the technology base for fab cities. Um, yeah, Jason is noting uh, in, um, I have linked in the recitation for Fab All In, uh, uh, Blair in that talks about uh, his work on building community. Uh, and so Jason has in the chat um, uh, a link uh, of Blair talking about that. Uh, and so it's this really interesting, thoughtful exor you know, exercise in hearing um, uh, how to build a community. Jason, Jason is also not noting, Rico talked about how to run a noodle shop, as in how to, how to make these uh, things uh, economically sustainable. Uh, and then this last link is, um, there could be many links for this last one, um, but this is one I wrote uh, with my brothers. Uh, Alan, who led the biggest video game studio at Activision, and uh, Joel, who led the National Labor Relations Organization. And they were excited by the research roadmap for digital fabrication, but concerned by how it goes out into society. And um, the internet started with great libertarian vision, but didn't really anticipate things like spam and fake news and income inequality. And so in the same sense, they were concerned about how digital fabrication goes into society, uh, expanding rather than reducing access, which is very much the um, story of the uh, fab all in. And so uh, again, in the in addition to the um, a uh, fab all in recitation in the education uh, recitation. Um, there was description, let's see. Oh, I guess we didn't cover it here because we covered it there. Um, but fab all in has emerged as an academy program and will be running again this fall on expanding access. Uh, what this article is looking at is the economic implications of uh, self-production. And so there's a basket of goods today that are used to measure things like inflation, uh, consumer price index. And um, you can't yet make everything in that in the fab lab, but increasingly um, components of the basket of goods consumers create can be made in the lab. And it really changes a lot. Um, uh, among the most sensitive issues right now are <clears throat> um, diverging income, uh, employment, uh, competition between parts of the world, um, uh, inflation, uh, tariffs, uh, barriers to trade are all among the most sensitive battles. If you go in the lab and make all the things I've spent the last hour talking about, it's not utopia, it's not free, but it fundamentally changes those assumptions. Um, and let's see, the, Adrian is posting the link I was looking for, which is uh, the Fab All In program.
from the last cycle and then it'll start again um, uh, this fall. Um, let me add that. And so when you make something in the lab, you could make it for yourself. Um, you could do it for friends and family. You could do it as a small business. You could do it one size larger on a community scale. But if you take the range of things I just did in this tour, it means you can replace a lot of global supply chains with local production. It eliminates the need for uh, infrastructure to ship things long distances. It, it eliminates the competition over that. Um, skills and jobs are local. Um, but then what it means is you don't need government to do things like regulate ports for import and things that are um, typically hard power, you do need soft power. You do need help in the logistics of this transition to sustainable local production. And so many of the things governments do aren't relevant. Many of the things they don't do are needed and it detours around many of the most sensitive battles uh, in the world today. And so ultimately, if you take all of the other things in this tour, what we're re really <clears throat> doing is inventing a new notion of an economy. Uh, a long time ago, agrarian economy was purely local. Then we went to pure, purely global based on consumption. Now we can marry the best of you can produce locally, um, but you can connect globally in this hybrid, really inventing a new notion of what is an economy. And ultimately, that's really what we're doing. The technology, you know, uh, the technology I covered in this class will become obsolete in the coming years as each of these skills changes. So, you know, it, it, we're starting to storyboard the future of Fab Academy and a few years out, you'll learn to make an integrated circuit and a few more years, you'll learn to microassemble an integrated circuit. Uh, all of that's gonna evolve, but what's not gonna change really is this. There's gonna be faster, better, cheaper ways to, to make things but what you can make, you can already do today. And it has these echoing um, implications of ultimately we're in reinventing how an economy, fun you know, from, from a lab to a community, to a city, to a country, to how an economy functions. So all of that is a tour through what you can do with the skills we've covered. Next week, I'm going to talk about just mechanics of managing invention through life cycle. And then the week after that, uh, I'm going to give you a tour through final projects through the years. And then we'll be up to the final presentations. So hopefully this tour inspired and challenged you to think about what you could try to accomplish. And this week, now you drill in to the final project plan. So the, the once again, the homework is uh, set up all of these questions. And then in the final presentation, you'll answer them. And I'm going to add one more line I left off, which is uh, make a schedule. I'm going to add um, just one, one more question, which is make a schedule for what will happen when? Okay, any final questions or comments? Okay. If not, Saturday open time, uh, let's see. Well, Jason has an interesting question. Um, it's a really relevant question. He says, any career implications? The reason that's relevant is uh, I, uh, so this is something I'm in particular starting to work on. From 
academy classes, we've created educational paths where we're moving up for a more advanced study, but there's lots of examples of people um, coming through Fab Academy and then going for more advanced study. Um, there are examples of people going through and then getting um, hired by existing companies. There are examples of startups coming out. But I would, my criticism would be, we have lots of examples of life-changing experiences through Fab Academy, but we haven't done a good job on the helping with the transition to the career stages afterwards. So something I'll talk about at the startup recitation is what's emerging is a distributed incubator where rather than you going to the incubator, the incubator comes to you in the same way Fab Academy does is something to help build um, alternative career pathways through the network. Uh, Jason, it's a good question because I'd say anecdotally there are lots of examples, but, but uh, institutionally, systemically, we haven't done a great job with the infrastructure for career transitions. It's, it's a bit similar to you know, a, a, a university has a career office and um, we really, um, uh, same thing Ricardo was asking about the HR platform. We've been working on building a job site, but it doesn't, it hasn't quite gotten traction. Um, we're working to refresh that, that we get a lot of requests to hire people with the skills and people looking for jobs. Um, uh, as part of this incubator, we also want to refresh the job site. This, this is a, very much a work in progress to, to help fill in. It, it's an important question to end today with. Okay, so take advantage of Saturday open time, the team, great team that runs that. Um, no recitation this Monday. Uh, and uh, the following week will be startups. And really, uh, more than anything here, um, uh, work on schedule. The most important thing for this week is make a plan between now and finishing. And we want to get as many of you through on that schedule. If you uh, fail that, you haven't failed, you'll just finish on the next cycle. But we want to get as many through as possible. OK, so that's the world of what you can do with the skills you've learned. And I'll see you all next Wednesday. Bye bye. Hasta luego. Bye. Thank you. Nos vemos. Bye. 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 Bye.